Hello, ladies and gentlemen. It is currently December 10th, 2009, and this is Day 9 Daily number 34. Today we're going to be doing a little bit of uh, Flash vs. Haya action going on today. And what I like about this game in particular is that, uh, first of all, it's Terran vs. Terran. We haven't done that in, in quite some time. Um, but also, I like it because it's a nice, quick, clean Terran vs. Terran. It doesn't have... Ah, my stupid webcam will not stay still. Jesus. There we go. It's a, it's a nice, clean Terran vs. Terran. It doesn't take, like, a million billion hours or anything like that. And it's an example of how to deal with um, a lot of early game pressure, which is what Haya tries to do against Flash. And Flash just repels it no problem whatsoever. Very calmly, very really strong play by Flash. Let's go ahead and just move right on over to uh, the map, right? This is our map. Um, Neo Moonglaive. I haven't actually. I didn't realize that they did all these new versions of the map. Like they did Neo Heartbreak Ridge, and apparently this is Neo Moonglaive. And I actually didn't even realize it was played on this new map until recently. I think they made these changes in the Pro League, and I'll, I'll investigate those later. But for now, let's just look at this map the way it is. Um, th probably the biggest thing I think to note is that controlling key areas of your high ground, in particular this area is really, really important in all matchups, but especially in Terran vs. Terran. Because, I mean, in Terran vs. Terran, if you're moving uphill and there's a bunch of mines, you can't snipe the mines nearly as well. Um, so you end up taking a lot of damage. So you see a lot of players do um, early expands, because those are safe. Um, on this map in particular, they're very, very safe. There's no ridge back here to worry about. These are fairly closed off. But then after the early expand, they'll go straight with a tank vulture rush right up to the front, and sometimes even try to poke into the opponent's base. But um, what, what really is the recurring theme I see is players aggressively taking these patches with, um, with vultures early on. Uh, I'm not going to go too much into late game dynamics. If you want uh, that, go watch Flash vs. Firebat Hero that we also did on Moonglaive then. Um, that was a great example of just sort of cross-map divisions and this sort of thing. But in this game, we're going to have Flash spawning up here, Haya spawning up here, and a very nice, clean early game um, by Flash as he repels... Um, an aggressive opening by Haya, an almost all-in-ish, I would dare say. Oops, there we go. Now we are watching the game. This is going to be a nice, quick little Terran vs. Terran. I'm so happy, because last Terran vs. Terran was like an hour and 20 minutes, and this, this cast should be closer to 45 or 50 minutes. So that way you can watch this cast, and you still have time to go get a taco before you go to bed, because tacos are really good. Oh, man, and also, by the way, I should probably stop and say this. I am casting the OSL games tonight in six and a half hours. I almost said five and a half hours. I don't know how I can't add so well. I was a math major in college. I don't know why I suck at just adding five and a half to things. Or six and a half to things. Whatever, I'm bad at it. But I'm casting tonight the OSL games. We're going to be doing all of them. I have a private stream set up because if any of you watched the last cast, that went hilariously badly at the start. All the streams crashed. But you should definitely tune in. Get all your friends to tune in. Your, your teachers from elementary school, get them to sign up. Get your grandma and everyone at the retirement home to load up the OSL stream cast tonight because there's going to be some incredible, incredible games. Um, a lot of Terran vs. Zergs going on tonight. So I'm really eager to see that. And we also get to see Gogo play. And for those of you who are unaware of this, Gogo and Best played this revenge match that was absolutely hilarious. I'm not going to spoil anything. Just go watch it immediately. It's in the small VOD thread at Team Liquid. So both players just continuing to build SCVs at the start. Nothing too drastic going on. Um, a lot of players get a little overexcited with when they send out guys to scout. Um, here's, a, by the way, a, a nice little early timing. You can just build your um, refinery and your barracks at the identical time. And then they, um, when the barracks finishes, you have 100 gas, so you can build a factory right away. That's why a lot of people do enjoy that timing in Terran vs. Protoss and Terran vs. Terran. But notice how Flash has not scouted yet. Flash is the North player, by the way. For if anyone ever curious about who's who, just look at the team names. KT, oh yeah, that's Flash. Something else I don't recognize, yeah, that's Haya. Yay, there we go. Easy as can be. Notice how Flash has not scouted yet. You always scout early because you are trying to find some bit of information that you need to know early on. If you're early expanding with Protoss, you send out that first probe that built the pylon because you need to know if your opponent is early pooling. Um, however, since there's probably not a lot of um, deviations going on early in Flash's game plan, there's no need for him to scout. So he's just, you know, happy and content, just sitting in his base, continuing to build stuff. And also, you'll note that Flash got that um, barracks and the refinery by waiting with an SCV. We saw an SCV not building early, so we could get these guys out. Um, if you're 
um, delaying SCV production to get your barracks and refinery out early like that, it can be a little dangerous to scout as well because you'd be blown away at how much money you end up losing. So we do see Haya developing a little bit of cheesy stuff going on here. Um, I'm interested to see, um, I actually know the answer to this, but I'm interested to see if Haya is going to continue to build down this way um, because right now there's no wall here at all but this looks like the start of building a wall off like this because a lot of times when you cheese like this you want to make sure that counterattacks don't come in and both players are continuing to do do little scouting action and see look at flash look at how little flash has scouted flash really has only gone to his natural in terms of um checking out what's up very safe, very normal play. What we're going to see from Flash is that he's going to be going one factory, one starport. Really, really easy opening to do. I actually prefer it from all the Terran openings just because it's... it's. <laughs> I find it easiest to do. Plus, I like having wraiths. I think it's cool to have flying things. I guess that's the... As a Zerg user, I want something that is as Mutalisk-like as possible. But anyways, we see a Vulture already coming out for Flash. A lot of players build um, early Vultures with their first factory. Just to try to run in, you can pick off a few marines at the front if your Terran opponent isn't careful. We do see Haya starting to do the completions of a wall in. Um, but yeah, see Haya um, trying to run this SCV away, but both players building an early vulture. Now this is the first thing I would notice if I'm um, flash in this spot. I'm hoping we get the chance to see it. Um, but th this angle, you, we saw Haya's Vulture coming in at this angle. Anytime that happens, where my Vulture, if you think as Flash's point of view, I'll actually do this from the mini-map. My Vulture comes out really early. Remember, I already um, got my gas and my barracks super early. So if my Vulture gets to here, and not only do I see a Vulture, but I see a Vulture coming from the side, I immediately know that the factory was not built inside my opponent's base. Let's suppose for a moment that Flash's Vulture got here and Haya's Vulture came from below. We still know that a factory has to be somewhere here in this region because only in this region would a Vulture have been able to get there so fast. But the angle sort of um, doubly illustrates that point. So what we're going to see is uh, we see Flash responding already by building a barracks. He clearly saw that angle from that Vulture and it's kind of going, oh, there's some cheese incoming. But watch how he responds to this. Incredible job. He opts not to build the um, the bunker. He's sending this guy around. Because again, if our opponent has something in the middle of the map, the last place that's going to be defended is the main. So we can definitely get a few free kills there. But we're going to see Flash commit quite a lot to the front of his base. And see, this is what I like about Haya. This is what I call a very stable form of cheese. He has prevented himself from losing to any sort of weird counterattacks like this. And look at this. Flash bringing an, an excellent number of SCVs. Five. You don't want to bring too many. It's really easy to just, you know, box 12 and send it. But he sends a very small number of SCVs there. And he's making wraiths and the tank. And what I really love is what he does with the wraith. I'll talk about that again in a little bit. So right now, we're Flash. We're almost certain we're getting cheese, right? We're, we're like 99% positive. We already saw a lot of units here early, and especially this. There's no reason that your opponent would ever do anything like that unless they were specifically cheesing. So look at what Flash does. Flash goes straight for the mineral line with this Wraith. Because if there are any units, they're going to have to return from somewhere in the middle over to the main here. So that's a really, really good choice already because we're drawing units away from our front. Uh, but more importantly, probably not a lot of anti-air coming out for Haya at this point. And watch how defensively we're going to see Flash play. Flash is not moving down. Flash is staying above at his ramp. There's the armory that we just saw. Pause a little bit too late for that. But this is something I really like about Tank Wraith. Or excuse me, I should say Factory Starport early on, is that it has a lot of versatility. You can do stuff like this, where you kind of obnoxiously kill off SCVs ultra-slowly. Uh, you can do some nice pushes, for instance, um, on Moonglaive in particular, this back door can be a real pain in the butt to deal with, to defend. Um, and 
The reason why Wraiths are such a key unit in this matchup is because of the sight range advantage. Yeah, you can have like a, you know, a barracks floating around somewhere to do something, but really the Wraith is always going to give you a sight range advantage wherever your tanks are. You don't have to wait for the barracks to get there. The Wraith is so fast that it can just zip around everywhere. So if you look at this map, um, if you get a few Wraiths and tanks out, um, you can move down to here and then swing around to this side. And most importantly, that geyser is really vulnerable. Look at that geyser. It's hugging this wall. Um, it's probably a little easier to see if we pretend that Hayo was here and we do the one factory, one starport. We can move right like this and we can use our wraith to take out this gas. So in a sense, yeah, sure, our opponent gets a little bit of extra minerals if he's expanded, but he's denied gas, and we can set up a good stronghold at our front, and this won't uh, get broken anytime soon. But even with, even if you can't pull off that tactic that we see right there, you can do this sort of thing, where you have the, um, the Wraith moving across like this. Haya also getting an Academy, incredibly interesting choice, because a lot of times players will hide one factory and then hide two starports. Um... Or hide a starport with cloaking. That's something that we've seen before. So it's important to be getting that academy out to deal with that. And and this is this is one of the most important things for academy. Whether you're playing against Zerg, um, you're worried about lurkers. Whether you're playing against Protoss, you're worried about DTs. Or whether here in Terran vs. Terran, you're worried about wraiths. You're getting the academy to solve that problem of what you're worried about. But you need to make sure that you're using that academy for something else. So for instance. Let's say I'm Flash, and I'm saying, okay, I'm going to get my Academy out early, so that way I can get scanned for a Wraith. But if I don't see any Wraiths, I'm going to scan his expansion at X time. I'll pick a specific time that I need to check his expansion. And if he has expanded, I can do a timing push and kill it. And if he has not expanded, or excuse me, yeah, if he has not expanded, then I know I can expand safely myself. You want him to have some big decision that you have the opportunity to make as a result of that scan. A lot of players will just get the scan for that thing they're worried about, like DTs, Lurkers, or Wraiths, and then they'll just let the scan build up. If you're getting scanned that early to solve a problem, make sure you can also use it for a benefit. So the Wraiths does in fact manage to kill off a pretty decent amount of uh, the Probies, more commonly known as SCVs. But see, this is also really good. Um, these wraiths are very good for defending this high ground because really, Flash is sticking to this top portion. He's not trying to expand here early. And if he gets wraiths, he can kill off any spotter so it becomes much more difficult to push up to this high ground. Flash slowly starting to inch forward, but look, look at the way he's going to position himself. He's not doing anything aggressive. He's just barely moving down to his low ground just outside his ramp. Let's see doing a little check out action with that um, with that SCV. And these wraiths now are, have become a pretty significant benefit. These marines also doing more scouting action. Going to be trying to pick off these SCVs because the SCVs are what will allow turrets to be built and that sort of thing and prevent scouting. And obviously it's just a cheap easy free unit. Um, so definitely an important thing to do with these wraiths. And see look at the decision making that Flash is making with these wraiths. He's moving forward um, kind of aggressively with the wraiths to pick things off, definitely shooting the tanks as one of the primary units. You can kill the SCVs first because they're so easy to kill, but the tanks really are going to be doing a ton of damage. And also another key thing to note, if you have the plus two upgrade for um, tanks, then my tanks kill your tanks in two shots. But early on, we don't have that. So it takes three tank shots. It barely takes that third. It'll bring the tank to just a little above zero life. So you can use the wraiths to just do a little bit of extra damage. Kind of like Protoss players bring a probe and a zealot because two hits from the probe and the zealot kill uh, a zergling as opposed to three hits from the zealot. The wraith is doing the exact same thing. So even if um, Flash doesn't kill off these tanks, if he just makes them a little mushy, just weakens them, ever so slightly, suddenly Flash's tanks become monstrously more effective. And see, look again. I'm pausing this game a lot, obviously, because it's nice and short, and I, I want to make sure I have a lot of content here, but also there's so much interesting going on. Notice how Flash moved down carefully, and then he kind of moved around with the Wraiths and the Marines, and the instant he saw stuff here, where did Flash go? He just secured this high ground area. Remember how I was talking about before the cast that this area is so important? Because if, you know, if our opponent secures it, not only are we pushing up high ground tanks, we're also pushing up high ground mines, which is a big pain in the ass. Flash just goes to secure that right away. And he's, he's not doing anything other than securing that with these, with these tanks. And see, look at this. A f just a few extra shots with those wraiths 
um, helps tremendously there. So now that Flash finally has his high ground secured, awesome. Now we can start doing some magic with these wraiths. Look at how very clear and calm everything um, Flash is doing. Let me say that again. Look at how this is nothing but calm, well thought out decision making. I mean, a lot of times when you look at this game, it looks like Flash sent a Wraith in, and then all of a sudden, oh my god, let me come back and let me clear out a little bit, and okay, I'm just going to go back in with Wraith. You know, the, the Wraith seems kind of all over the place, but really, um, if we just think about it from a very objective standpoint, we get to pause a lot, we realize that that first, first Wraith moved in to Hayao's base because there's free SCVs and virtually no anti-air, and Flash was not ready to move out. Then when Flash is ready to move out, we pull the wraiths back, help our tanks move out to a good position. Now that our tanks are in a good position, sweet, let's go try to do some more harassment with the wraiths. Excellent, excellent decision making with those wraiths. Very calm, nothing too extreme by Flash, just playing defensively and just inking out little tiny bits of um, advantage here and there. Now we're finally getting the expansion. I mean, at this point, pretty even from both players, except Flash has a little bit more mobility with those wraiths. He has that sight range advantage with the wraiths, and Flash has secured his high ground. Definitely good, good, good spot to be in for our friendly neighborhood Flash. Really good positioning, and now see, we're, we're, this is a good little transition, we're getting cloaking, so that way we can um, punish our opponent for having to be spread out. Cloaking is going to punish the fact that we have factories here that would require a scan to defend, tanks here that would require a scan to defend, and our main here that requires a scan to defend. In essence, getting that um, cloaking forces our opponent to start getting an engineering bay with turrets cannot rely on scan any longer, especially considering that we're still in the early game and both players do not have two command centers. If you had two command centers worth of scan, maybe you could get away with it if you're super good. And see, this um, this barracks obviously is helping a little bit with this vision, but pretend for a moment if this barracks wasn't here, um, these wraiths are going to help with the vision advantage. And let's pretend for a moment that we have this same setup right now, but Haya also has a barracks. Great, these wraiths can sit right about here and shoot at the barracks, and these wraiths are completely defended from any goliaths, so we still get a sight range advantage that way. So look at that, just a few shots, and then he's going to have to back off. Ideally, he would like to take out the tank, but he's happy moving back, and see, look at this. With a sight range advantage, my tanks can inch forward at your tanks. Notice how he stopped shooting at this one, and is immediately shooting at this one to get just a few points of damage so that these two tanks can kill it in one shot. Pow, dead. Uh-oh. Oh, sneaking out in time. Very careful, slow advance from Flash, and very, very little that Haya can do about this. Unless, of course, Haya wants to waste scan. Look, another tank gets pissed off. Unless Haya wants to waste scan, getting a little bit of sight range. But that's only a temporary solution. Very calm, slow inching forward by Flash, using these wraiths to push. Look how aggressively he's able to push forward. And then we want to take out these SCVs. We don't want any turrets getting built. We don't want anything getting repaired either. Barracks getting a little bit far forward, but still we want to take out these tanks at the extremities um, of the of the line. Now, if we stop for a moment and we pretend that Haya never built these two factories over here, that instead Haya had built these two factories over here, we can still see that Flash is in an excellent position, right? He's just slowly inching forward, and look at that. A few shots here, and then Flash moves his tanks up along here, just off vision range here to pick off these guys at the edge. And look, this tank hasn't even really done anything. And now we're starting to kill off all the Goliaths. Very slow, very steady, inching forward just out of range. Going to move these tanks forward. We hear them unseaging and watch them. They're just going to inch down. Uh-oh, we have to move back. And this is what I found really hilarious, is that right now Flash just wanders over here and kills off these two factories. But he's not really committing too much to this attack. Look, he's still keeping a nice wide angle right there. I mean, look at the minimap. I'm going to move my mouse away so everyone can see that big wide arc of white units. If we go back here and look at this map, so right now Flash was pushing down here, and then Flash was obviously pushing with tanks here, eating away at um, Haya's, eating away at Haya's setup right here. Um, and the problem is that um, once Haya's running back here, a lot of players are going to just box these tanks and just send them right over here to kill this off. But obviously that leaves a gap right in this region for defense. But Flash is very carefully just leaving enough guys to defend this front and just barely enough to kill this off with ease. 
And watch the way that Flash is going to do this. It's really, it's really gentle the way he, he kills this base. He's not doing anything extreme, like just sending all his units. And see, look, only took two tanks shots because those wraiths were doing a little bit of extra damage. Because, you know, a lot of times, if, um, yes, you just need one more tank shot to murder that. Excuse me, one more wraith shot to murder that. Um, you know, if, if you're getting cheesed, a lot of players like to have extreme responses to cheese. Um... I think the the most natural one would be um, the original Peaks of Baekdu. Not not Sin Peaks of Baekdu, which actually I think is one of the best maps of StarCraft ever made. The original Peaks of Baekdu that was violently, horrifically, awfully, horribly imbalanced. Um, where pretty much Protoss players realized that they could proxy gate a Terran um, with Zealots and Dragoons. And there was absolutely nothing that, that the Terran could do about it. You could get Dragoons above the high ground of the Minerals. And then the Terran was pretty much doomed. Uh, and a lot of Terran players responded by building a factory in the Protoss' main. So as Protoss was trying to hammer down the Terran with his proxy gate, um, the Terran would just kill off all the probes in the um, would kill off all the probes in the Protoss main. Actually, the the game I'm thinking of where where I started to see that a lot was um, Iris vs. the Rock on the original Peaks of Baekdu. Hilarious game. Um, and I see that bleed over, especially at the lower levels. People have these extreme, extreme counter cheeses, you know. Like, if I hold off a bunker rush, I immediately send a bunch of zerglings straight to my opponent's main, and I constantly make a bunch of zerglings. Um, or if there's a factory float, people, like, rush to kill that factory or anything like that. But instead, what we saw in this game is that Flash um, simply focused on taking this and then inched forward as though it were a completely normal game. And considering that he treated it like a completely normal game, eventually, when Flash does manage to get to those proxy factories, Flash is going to get a huge benefit at that point in time. Flash is not rushing to get that benefit, because there's no need. When Flash is playing his normal style, he's advancing forward very calmly to here. And only later is he killing us off. I mean, I'm actually going to inch this bar down. I mean, if you look at the YouTube bar, the video is actually pretty close to finished at this point. Um... Very, very late in the game is Flash actually taking out those two factories. But look at this. This is a crippling blow for Haya at this point. And there was virtually no circumstance um, or no time at which Flash would have lost at any point earlier. Just because he played very, very calmly. Very good response. Look at this. Look at this. Just three SCVs. There's three Wraiths and one tank. Just killing these off very slowly. More tanks. You'll see these tanks are just... These little blips on the minimap are tanks that are reinforcing this line. You see that barracks coming out here, sort of closing off um, this area a little bit more. And other than that, no major commitment here at all. So now we have Haya still spending resources, maybe trying to keep these things alive, but really nothing's going to come out of it. These three wraiths are just happily being repaired by these SCVs. And I mean, Haya doesn't have any factories in his main. And at this point... Flash, who's been... What he's doing is he's kind of milking units out of these factories. He's slowly letting more and more units come out that die, that are committed to stay here. And then Flash is building up on tank count and units from his two factories in his main. And then after a while, he gets a bunch of tanks and he just walks into his opponent's base and just kills it off. I mean, we're going to see Haya leave real soon here. But that's also another, another thing I want to highlight. Um, notice how, actually I'm going to go briefly back to this game, um, if we, if we look at the screen, here are two factories. If we kill them off, that means our opponent is not going to have that many units later. A lot of people screw this up. They'll kill those two factories, and then they will immediately attack. What we saw Flash do in this game is he positioned the three race, the three SCVs in the tank, by those proxy factories, and he just hung out there. He killed, I think, maybe four tanks, maybe three or four Goliaths. He basically milked those units out of the, uh, of the factories, and then he attacked. And what we are seeing here on the main screen is these guys, these tanks... We finally have exceeded our opponent in tank count. Flash finally has more units than Haya because he's been spending a good energy killing guys off here. So then when this final push happens, it's good game. There's absolutely nothing that um, uh, that Haya can do about this. And and I like that example that, that we got to see here because you know a lot of players will storm drop their opponent. 
kill off a ton of drones or a ton of SCVs, but then they'll attack immediately. If you screw up the economy of your opponent or screw up his ability to produce units, you need to wait a little bit of time before that timing window appears. And that's what was great about this game, is we clearly saw this incredible patience by Flash. I mean, I'm actually going to go back and show you how long into the game Flash was abusing this, right? So here, um, right now, we are at the 11 minute, um, or excuse me, we're at the 12 minute mark. I, w I would say 11 minutes and 50 seconds, but you know, 12 minutes. So starting right here, if we look at the minimap, this is where Flash is finally pushing forward, right? Finally pushing forward, and see, we're at the 12-minute mark. Things are dying. We're at the 12-minute and 30-second mark. Things are still dying. We're at the 13-minute mark. It's been a little over a minute that Flash has been killing off units here. And then look, and now these guys are pushing forward. A full minute and a half worth of units coming out of here are dead. They never got the chance to, to go anywhere. Flash waited a full 90 seconds before advancing forward, which in StarCraft time is really, really long. So I think that's an incredible, incredible illustration of that of that example. So um, I like that one, and now I'm happy to take some questions. And if you'd be so kind as to post it in a more fluorescent color so I can read it easily. Um, T-Fact Rats asked the most reasonable question. What advice do you have for people learning Terran vs. Terran? Uh, my immediate advice is to realize that mid-game for Terran vs. Terran is a very long period of time. Um, and a lot of it has to do with tank placement. So if we look over here at the map, for instance, let's suppose that we are down here and our opponent is up here. Immediately we kind of try to see where the divide comes in this map. It's, it looks like it's going to be right here. This expansion is going to probably be key defense, or excuse me, key position for the, for the late stages of the game. But mid-game consists of generally you having four bases and moving around um, a whole bunch. Um, and because I emphasize mid-game learning so much, what I would say that a Terran player would then want to do is think a lot about what positions are key to hold, uh, both in terms of ground to prevent tank push and in terms of dropping. So if we just look at Moonglaive, we know that we want to secure this one pretty early on. We also want to make sure we kill movement between here and here and here and here. We want to prevent any guys from coming down at us. So we want good tank placement here and good tank placement here. So that way we can dominate our half of the map really easily. Um, also note that if you're expanding this way, you're kind of going to kind of be scooping around with drops like this. So I think that's a pretty key thing to think about in Terran vs. Terran. And also just a, a handful of small, I don't know how to, I guess I would say seemingly insignificant pieces of land. So let's say we're late game in Terran vs. Terran, right? Um, our opponent is up here and he's expanded like, or actually let's say we're up top here. This is probably a better illustration. So we're up here, we've taken these. Our opponent has taken these. And we take this expansion and our opponent takes this expansion here. The natural question um, would be, uh, is, is how am I going to really put the herd on this expansion? The easiest thing to do really is to drop tanks here. At this seemingly insignificant portion of land, if we drop tanks here in the very late game, we prevent our opponent from really getting any gas here. So in a sense, we have all these expansions with geysers. And by the way, I, I realize now that on Neo Moonglaive, um, this expansion has a, a gas. It didn't use to. This used to be a mineral only. Um, but still, you know, you're going to have one, two, three, four, five, six gases, and you've prevented your opponent from having one. And your opponent only has one, two, three, four, five gases, and you can let that advantage extend out over time. So looking for those key positionings um, in the mid game, I think, are most critical. And also have a lot of patience. You know, pl play with a friend. Limit the amount of builds you do. Pick pick an opening that sets you up for a good mid game, and just do that over and over and over again. Um, uh, let's see. Um, I will answer this one. Uh, <laughs> uh, Uber Delix says, out of all your measurement words, um, such as mutton and noodle, what's your favorite? Probably a touch. Just a touch is what I like to say. Absolute favorite. So um, Joe Ick says, Flash has seemed to uh, systematically dominate his opposition in the mid game and late game. Why is this? Um, first of all, for those of you who are unfamiliar with this, I'm, I believe Flash has an 18 game win streak in Terran vs. Terran right now. I'm pretty sure it's either 17 or 18. Um, and we don't include like the All Star and the STX Cup, those sort of fun events. And also, I'm not including the GOM TV Classic where he, he got one loss from Iris. Um, but 18, I'm pretty sure, is the, is the number right now, I'm not including those games. 
And and um, so yeah, he's obviously a beast. And I think that the reason he's really really good is because he does focus on these little tiny patches of land. I'm going to open up another map, and I sincerely hope it doesn't crash the stream because I really want to highlight. Whoops, highlight one instance where this is really good on Neo Medusa in his epic game um, come on load Team Liquid go I'm using the wonderful Team Liquid Pro Gaming database that uh, all of you should use on a daily basis um, on this game there was um, on this map Firebat Hero and Flash played an absolutely epic game right um, Firebat Hero did an excellent job of pushing forward using that Wraith sight advantage that he had um, and what eventually ended up happening is that uh, Firebat here pretty much had all this uh, excuse me about all this and these mineral expansions and Flash was kind of boxed into these and in particular Flash was having trouble with this expansion so the reason that um, Flash I think won this game is because he just sieged a bunch of tanks up in this corner to the point where those tanks were impenetrable was preventing his opponent from taking this expansion and was hopefully hopefully going to um, have the opportunity to push forward Push, kill these tanks a little bit, and then take this expansion, which is eventually what did end up happening. But I think it's because Flash emphasized just landing units back here, just defending this piece of land. A lot of uh, players wouldn't really do much with this, wouldn't focus as heavily as Flash did on it there. And I think that that is an excellent example of the sort of thinking that Flash does that makes him so, 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 so good. Um... Is that he does that sorts of thing, that sort of thing from start to finish. Also, Flash just has excellent defense, and he's very, very calm. Like we saw in this game, he just had really good defense, played very normally, didn't overreact, and then just eventually punished his opponent. Um, so let's see here. So Ment Terran says. Uh, do you think wraiths are more of a finesse unit than practical strategy? It seems it's much easier to get a response from uh, a response from Terran when you one factory fast expand and macro up a nice army. Uh, than trying to annoy them with a race. Does it do enough damage um, to be better than the economic build? That's a great question. Um, I'm going to rephrase it just a little bit, if you don't mind. Um, I, I'm, I'm pretty sure that um, what we're being asked here is, if I am doing this tank wraith opening, and I can annoy them and do the stuff where I kind of poke in and kill off a few SCVs, is it worth it? Because I could just early expand and get more stuff. I think um, what makes... The reason I like it, um, and the reason it's important is that you, um, well, let me rephrase that, the reason I like it, and kind of the crux of the build, is that you need to do something with the tanks and the wraiths early. Um, so, for instance, one would be to advance here, around this backside, and then you punish an early expansion. We've seen a lot of players who open up with tanks and wraiths do that, where, though they get a later expansion, they're able to get in a better position and punish their opponent's expansion. So then my opponent has to lift and move back, I have this secure position, and then I end up expanding and I slowly overcome them. What we saw end up happening here is that this push with these tanks that Flash was doing right in this area was so much faster as a result of those wraiths, and that's why I like them so much, is that you can do those sorts of things. Oh, also, let me go back to the main screen briefly. You can also get a good positioning on this ever so important high ground if you open up Tank Wraith, because um, you can just advance so far forward. The only thing you'd need to worry about is if your opponent made a ton of vultures, in which case you'd probably have to play a little bit more defensively with your Tank Wraith, but it's still okay, because your gas units are really negating all those minerals they spent on the vultures. Um... So, again, I think that's a reasonable thing to do. You know, I think I will take this question. Uh, Captain Platypus is asking why I'm such a huge fan of Sin Peaks of Baekdu. Um, so a lot of people complain about the Terrans being weak there. Um, um, I think the reason that I like it so much is it's this very weird, windy map with a sort of poorly defined center. It's very, I guess I would want to say, it's poorly defined where the action is supposed to happen. I mean, if we look over here in Moonglaive, it's very clear that action is going to be happening a lot in this middle area, uh, and then coming off for these expansions. Just a lot of action going on in the center. Um, with Peaks of Baked, it was just all over the place. There's just all these insane troop movements. So, I mean, for instance, on Peaks of Baked, um, a tactic I like doing is Zerg, is I position my whole army along one of the exits to the base. So if my opponent, my Terran opponent, pushed along that exit, I would just do the normal sort of defense. But if my opponent pushed along the other exit, I would counterattack his main. And that's an opportunity that um, I don't really get to do on a lot of other maps, and that counterattack is very, very effective. I just think it leads to really cool dynamics.
dynamic, fun sort of play. Also, because each expansion individually is easy to defend on Peaks of Baked Two, it allows for a lot of creative one base strategies where, because it's so easy to take your second and your third. Um, I just think it's really cool. I just think it has a lot of defining features that um, a lot of other maps have mimicked, such as the early rush distance, but the long push distance. Oh, God, I have this itch on my back, and it feels so good to scratch. Oh, my God, it's fantastic. Wonderful, wonderful thing here. So, um, Shot Coder says, uh, What are your thoughts on 3 Factory Vulture on this map, with mines then expand? I'd probably prefer 2 Factory Vulture. Um, I think the reason is that um, early expanding is so easy on this map. And um, if your opponent is a good early expander, like gets those two factories out really nice and early on, he can actually wall in his front, and your three factories worth of vultures can't really get in there. And even if he doesn't wall in his front, he's probably going to build buildings and position his tanks and vultures in a way that you can't quite break it. So the three factory uh, vulture is not as effective against that. Um, and the reason you would be going three factory vultures, other than to try to push in and kill them, is to, is to mine up these ever so important regions right outside the entrance to our opponent's base. And I think Two Factory Vulture still accomplishes that same task with the um, with the mines. Let's you get your expansion out a little bit earlier and you end up getting tanks a little bit earlier. So I'd probably say I prefer that. Um, I just think it's a little bit too closed off at the expansions um, to be able to do that that effectively. I'd probably prefer the map to be a little bit more open. Um, so, someone named Day9 says, What do you suggest um, the overall goal is in Terran vs. Terran um, that will get you ahead? Is it more focused on macro or micro? I would say it is most reliant on your, the positioning of your tanks. Tanks define the entire structure of the matchup. Because, you know, four siege tanks can kill six unsieged tanks if the unsieged tanks are coming at a bad angle. Um, so really what the most important thing to do is um, is positioning your tanks in really good areas. Obviously we want good macro and micro, but um, um, it, that's not really the key. If you get in these good positions, like if I'm Terran and I manage to, like, and I'm Terran here and I expand here and I manage to secure this area and this area, awesome, now I can expand this gas expansion here. I have two secure gas expansions. And I'm going to start slowly adding on turrets and dropships to give me some more mobility here. And then I'll maybe expand up here. And then I'll be pushing up northward. And I'm going to focus a lot on securing this little strip of land. Um, or maybe even trying, if I can, to break in and get some tanks up here, then I'll have this arc, which pretty much secures me this and denies my opponent these two. Um, getting really good tank positioning and really good spotting is essential. So obviously you're going to have your barracks floating around the middle, but if you can even get your engineering bay or another building in there too, it's going to be instrumental for that late game success. So focus a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot, especially if you're an early player, on where am I placing my tanks um, to hold these key positions so that I can expand or attack in important ways. I'm trying to think of a good... Um, Example of offense. I'll just go ahead and use this map. Um, oh no, Neo Medusa is a great example. Um, if we can get a good contain going on our opponent, um, we can suddenly, like for instance, um, what's a? I'm trying to think of a not contrived example. So let's say I'm here and my opponent's up here. I obviously want to push, but I want to push and or I want to obviously want to get some control over the center. But if I can get some tanks here, anywhere around here, I can start killing off this temple, and then my opponent suddenly is worrying um, about some sort of attacks. So defensively I can set up this, but then all of a sudden I can use this, the control over the edge of this expansion, to start dropping and pushing into my opponent's main. Um, a lot of times in Terran vs. Terran you'll see a player spawn here and he'll take these three bases, but then his fourth one will be this base, because he'll advance up here, which obviously defends this, but that defense here extends into an offensive capability by dropping up here and then dropping into the main. So all these um, these seemingly unimportant bits of terrain can be instrumental in pushing into your opponent's base and really, you know, bringing the noise a little bit. So I'm just going to take two more questions. Um, do, 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 do. um so um. <laughs> How important is unit composition when gently destroying cheesy expansions? Wraith Tank seems like one of the best compositions. And uh, I'm wondering if Flash's play works always. Um, this question by Not Jack. I would say that... Um, 
Um, I, I would not worry too much about the unit composition so much. Um, obviously, the tanks and the wraiths were helpful in killing that off, but I think the three SCVs were probably the most important component of that gentle destruction. Because a unit pops out for Haya, it shoots a couple of times, and then it dies. And the three SCVs repair everything there. And then when the next unit comes out, it does a few shots, and then doesn't kill anything, and then Flash can continue to repair. So, um... I mean, other examples would be, like, if this has actually happened to me, where a Terran player, um hid two barracks in the middle of the map, but I wasn't able to access them early. So then I was able to push forward um, with Lings and Lurkers, and I, 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 I killed off those two barracks, and then I sent all my Lurkers and Lings to the front of his base, burrowed there, and then just pulled back with some Zerglings. I focused more on getting... Whoa, sorry, I just smacked my mic. Hope that wasn't too big of a thud. Um, I focused on just getting a good positioning set up, and then I, uh, you know, with my Lurkers outside his base, and then I just took the rest of my units... Um, that weren't going to be doing anything right now and use them. So in terms of unit composition, just think of what's not essential. So for instance, if I burrowed my lurkers at those barracks, I wouldn't get a good contain at my Terran opponent's front. So I brought the lurkers to my opponent's front and then brought the zerglings back. So that's really the only unit composition thing I think that would relate to that, um, is just using the non-essential units. That's why all those tanks that were in the middle of the map, Flash kept there and instead brought his wraiths back to really put the hurt on so let's just take one last question. We'll take it from Pretty Little Pony. Uh, Pretty Little Pony says, Is the mid-game the most important to any matchup? Um, it depends on what you mean by important. What I would say is that um, it's what allows you to define a lot of your decisions. Because I talk, especially in the um, map analysis, I did a Fighting Spirit. We have another map analysis coming up here soon as well. On Fighting Spirit... Um, I discussed the idea that there's mid-game convergence, that there's a limited set of possibilities that occur in the mid-game. Um, what would be a good example? Um, I'll just use Zerg vs. Terran, since I'm using a lot of Zerg vs. Terran examples today. Um, the Terran player is almost always going to be coming out with five barracks, one factory, one starport with a vessel, and will be and will have one um, engineering bay, and probably making another one. That pretty much happens all the time when Terran's going Medic Marine. Or he can be going mech. There's, these are really the two distinct mid-games that I can think of that Terran has. There's a third that's less common, which, which would be getting two factories before the starport. So it's four barracks, two factories, one starport. The, you know, the, um, the vessel's going to come out a little bit later. But I mean, really, that's about it for mid-game. So what ends up happening, uh, and the reason I illustrate the mid-game is so important, is that if we think about the openings, there's all this crazy stuff going on. I mean, our opponent could go two barracks, bunker rush, he could go um, he could hide proxy factories in the middle of the map, he could just do a normal proxy or a normal factory push in his main, he could go two port wraith, he could just tech up to Valkyries and expand and do that Vionic play that Fantasy does. There are so many different variations. But if we acknowledge in our head that there's a small set of future things and focus on that, Anytime we want to make an adjustment to our play, we know what we are adjusting to, right? Um, if I only think of things from the early game and only from the opening, what ends up happening is I go, crap, I'm in this situation. What do I want to do now? If I have a mid-game plan, I get to go, well, I know what I want to do, so how do I do it from this position I'm in right now? So if you have really good structures for just what you're dealing with, with that small set of stuff going on in the mid-game, it helps guide everything you want to do. So for instance, in, in a lot of Terran mid-games, I'm going to go back to uh, Moonglaive, both players will have this, and the question is, how do I secure a third and a fourth? Uh, for a lot of matchups, it's just a third, but you know, it's really... Um, Three and four uh, for Terran vs. Terran, pretty important. So how are you going to go about doing that? Well, I'm going to push up here with tanks like this to secure this, and then I'm going to secure this third and fourth. Excuse me, straight after each other. Well, uh-oh, when I was in the early game, my opponent contained me with vultures. Um, how do I deal with that? Well, okay, I'm going to get, I'm going to scan, push here, or maybe, maybe I'm going to try to push around like this. And I'll take this as my third, and once I get dropships, I'll kill all this stuff off, and then move up to this position and this position and take my fourth. Let's say my opponent early expanded. I just get to walk up here and take this position and this t position, take my third and my fourth. Let's say my opponent, um, was going for, um, heavy dropship harass. So he was doing tons of drops like this. I kind of need to stay back a little bit. So I might 
you know, just siege up barely above here, mainly in this region to secure my third. And then once I get enough turrets and dropships myself, I'll move my tanks here and here, and then I'll take a fourth. I'm getting to the same spot every single time. Um, I'm doing different variations before then, but they all kind of, you know, are... It's like a delta. It just dumps out of the... the it dumps into the same river in the end. There's all these little branches, but pff, you eventually get to the same spot. So that, I think, is the absolute essential key in, in all matchups. And, you know, Terran vs. Terran, obviously, is a matchup, so I think it's true there, too. Uh, a lot of people like to ask if I'm stoned or high. I actually don't take any things at all. I mean, I pretty much only drink energy drinks. I don't smoke. I don't really drink. Um, I drink a lot of milk and a lot of uh, energy drinks, a lot of coffee, caffeine, green tea. Love caffeine. Mmm, caffeine. Um, which basically means that for any of you wondering about my personality... I'm just like this. <laughs> just it's the way I work. It's how I roll. Um, obviously, obviously, we're going to be doing the OSL cast tonight in five and one half hours. Come back here. I have to do a, a project. I have to work straight up till one. But when I return, mm, gonna be doing a little bit of OSL casting action. Bam! Ah, thug snapping it up. Hopefully, I'll have some nice YouTube videos and some fun little soundtrack action going on. And most importantly, I hope I have a stream. So thanks so much, everyone, for uh, tuning in. Um, uh, please tune in tonight for the OSL cast. We're going to have a lot of good matches coming up next week. In particular, we have Effort against Ruby on um, Odd Eye, I think is the name of the map. Great game. And then we're also going to have the nuttiest Zerg vs. Zerg that anyone's ever seen, which is Zero vs. Type B on Match Point. So, um, yeah, sincerely hope all of you show up for that. Uh, thanks so much again, and big heart to everybody, because I am almost at 5 million viewer minutes. So, cheers!